Uh, as he said, what I'd like to do is talk about some lessons learned on AIM. We've had many lessons learned, more than I can talk about in the time that I have. Um, just to give you first a, just an introduction to what AIM is and what we're doing. This instrument or this mission has three instruments: uh, a solar a solar occultation instrument. Uh, there, a, a, a panoramic uh, nadir imager and an NC dust collection instrument. Uh, we're looking at noctilucent clouds. Noctilucent clouds are clouds that occur at 50 miles above the Earth's surface. Those clouds occur maybe seven miles above the Earth's surface. We're interested in them because they're changing, they're getting brighter, they're occurring more often, uh, and we don't know why these, are hap these things are happening. We think it's because of some connection with uh, global change. So the whole goal of AIM is to determine why these clouds form and vary. That's what the mission's about. Uh, the mission uh, was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, it's a Pegasus launch. Uh, it was more fun than anything I've done in my whole life uh, to, to take part in that, and that's, that's the absolute truth. Um, we got into a near-perfect 600-kilometer orbit uh, by the Pegasus with no uh, assistance. It just That's the way it worked. Uh, the observatory is working well. We're getting great data. Uh, we're learning a lot about the clouds now. <clears throat> we're approved through 2014. Here's just an image, one of the uh, images of the clouds for a particular day, July the 8th. So that's what AIM is. Now let's now I'll go into some of the lessons learned. And I'll start out with this one comment, which is really the kind of the theme of the whole presentation, that Louis Pasteur said, in the field of observations, chance favors only the prepared mind. We, we were constantly working, thinking, looking, and trying to anticipate issues, and I think that's what, what enabled us to get through. So the first couple of things, the first lessons that we were dealing with were uh, evolving technical requirements, uh, changing Pegasus loads, and then evolving managerial requirements, which were reviews. The Pegasus load situation was that um, <clears throat> We started out, and, and I'll tell you the lesson as I briefly tell you this story, we started out with certain loads that we were given that the Pegasus would inject into our observatory and therefore into the instruments. And as time went on, that kept changing. Uh, the, the next, uh, only um, oh, about two or three months into the program, we got some new numbers that were higher. Uh, the first time we got it, we said, well, we can handle that. We're, gonna, we're not going to... Uh, we're going to just uh, design an isolation system to protect the instrument. Got the new numbers, those are higher. Well, we could, we'll revise the isolation system. That'll take care of it. We went, and went further about one year after that, literally as we were going into the pre-environmental readiness review for the mission. At that point, we got a phone call. It said, oh, the lows, we made an error. The lows have gone up again. So it was just a, a nightmare. Um, the, the lesson learned there was we should have right in the beginning caged the mirror system. We didn't have to worry about any of that. And it would have been a little more expensive, a little more time, but that would have been the right thing to do. So that's how we dealt with that. We had, uh, in an 18-month period, we had to deal with 50 reviews. Now, some of these reviews were uh, like peer reviews uh, and those kinds of things, but none of the reviews ended up being informal reviews. They were all reviews we had to put action items in and had to, had to respond to them and all that. Uh, so the only thing we could do to deal with that was we uh, negotiated and talked with a, a very helpful project office, uh, Explorers project office, and we got a, uh, a cost cap change because of things we, these are things we had not planned on and were imposed upon us. Okay, so that's uh, the first lesson. Now the... Uh, now it's the past seven. Yeah, okay. So then the, the next one, the third one, and a really a hard lesson is, a, is, is the one I'm talking about here. Uh, be prepared to deal with unforeseen requirements going to appear late in the program. And in our case, it could se severely uh, threaten schedule. And what I'm talking about here is that we uh, we started out in, when the AIM mission and the way the AO was written, the way we responded was, it's a PI-determined parts program, mission safety assurance. But as we started getting into the mission and as things started happening in the agency, like the Columbia accident, for example, then that all started to change, and we started having a, a full-up parts program imposed on us. We didn't get any cost relief from that. Uh, we worked the problem with the project office the best we could. But the issue was... That, okay, I'm sorry. 
Uh, the issue was that this came after long leap procurements of the spacecraft parts had already occurred. Uh, it, it, and it resulted in some very significant discussions and review at the highest levels of NASA just prior to launch. Uh, it held up the observatory ship into the launch site for several days. And there's a story I want to tell you about that. Um, we, we had the observatory packed up in the van, ready to go uh, to Vandenberg Air Force Base where the launch occurred. On a Friday, I got a call from uh, Mike Ruskevich, who was in the deputy director of Goddard at the time. I wanted to know if I could come to a meeting with the Goddard Management Council on Sunday afternoon. I said, sure, that'd be fine. I'll be up there. I pretty, not a, it's a three-hour drive, so I'll be there. And so Orlando was there. So he remembers this meeting very well. Uh, and it was all about parts. And the, the project office had been working very hard with us to try to retire all the parts issues uh, that we had. Uh, there were destructive testing was done wherever you could, and then the rest had to be done by analysis. And the issue was at this point in time, as I remember, there was about seven parts that were still in question where the analysis hadn't been completed. Uh, we were ready to go to the launch site. The, as I say, the observatory had been packed. And so the whole discussion on that meeting with the Goddard Management Council was, should we ship this observatory or not? So it was a long discussion about it. Goddard experts were there. Uh, did great, everyone did a great job. And at the end of the, the discussion, which is about as I remember, about a three hour discussion, Mike Escavage asked all the people to comment and who went around the room, and everybody, and I was the last one around the table, and he, he came to me last. Every one of the members of the Goddard Management Council said, Don't ship. And then he asked me, What is my position? What do you think I said? I said, Ship. That's exactly right. Uh, I said, Ship. My vote I was only one out of many, so that was a decision. And of course, the Goddard Management Council and they have a diff they had technical authority, but also programmatic authority. So and they acknowledge that if the program said it's shipped, and that's that's also a consistent, it's okay. So we got on the phone with um, uh, Mike there with Colleen Hartman, who was acting AA at the time, and Ed Waller, who was the director of Goddard at that time. Told them all the reasons, and that's the way it remained. I went back to my hotel room. I was very troubled by the whole thing. I then wrote down, I was on the order of 11 reasons why I thought we should ship it. At 11 o'clock that night, I sent an email to Ed Waller. 15 minutes later, he came, came back with an email. And I sat on his blackberry while he was sitting there or something. And he said, okay, these are new, uh, new uh, wrinkles. We should look at this some more, and we'll get back. And so... That kind of started the ball rolling. The next day I was riding uh, home and I called Vicki Ellsburn, who was the program executive at that time. Vicki said, I, I was up all night about this. I, I was just so troubled by the whole thing. So that, that's the kind of program executive you want, which is another lesson learned I'll talk about in just a minute. But anyway, the long story short of all this was that God looked at the reasons that I gave. Uh, I went out to last on the following Wednesday and we had another telecon with Colleen Hartman and Ed Waller and us in the project. And after further discussion, we all agreed and Colleen Hartman approved of shipping to the launch site. So that's the way that all came down. But the main point, the lesson learned is, it is absolutely critical that uh, no matter what the AO says, make sure an agreement's in place on those kinds of things uh, right in the beginning. Okay, another thing which is a great lesson we learned, and this is something you've heard all through this uh, presentation today, a cohesive, cohesive team is so important and so essential in uh, getting this work done. We, we deal in a complex world. There are many, uh, there are hard things we're doing. All the easy things have been done. And so a, a strong and cohesive team is essential. And here we had, we had to develop a workaround to overcome an intermittent loss of command capability of the Ames spacecraft. We couldn't command the spacecraft. Uh, it started out just after launch on a Saturday evening. I got a call from the project manager so we can't we can't command. Okay, and we talked about what, what are you doing, what have we done. I went out to Colorado uh, at that point and we tried all kinds of things. We were, after four days we were able to command again, but it turns out that this was a deteriorating thing. Uh, but at that point in time we didn't know that and after we tried many things, I told the project manager, look, we've got to get as autonomous as we can, as quick as we can. And that's all I said to the project manager turn it over to the team. The team did a remarkable job 
uh, an amazing job, in my opinion, in dealing with this problem. Uh, the, uh, we, we ended up being able to achieve autonomy by uh, not only the keying off of uh, solar signals in, in, in orbit, that's the way we could set it up so it turn instruments on and off using the orbital period. Uh, when the space shuttle would pass over a, uh, a um, ground site for a data dump, it automatically sensed it, dumped the data. Uh, and that's the way it is today. We're running autonomously, completely autonomously. Um, but the other thing we're able to do is they came up with a way uh, by using the Tetris link and varying the uh, strength of the signal from Tetris to the AIM spacecraft in a coded way. And we could, we could build in on the order of 20 commands that way that we would have to use if we had a, a problem. And that's the way that ended up. So that was a tremendous result. Okay, the, the next thing I want to talk about is just the relationship between the project team and various members of the team. And, and I really want to talk about this upper part of this box here, uh, uh, just for this part of this, this talk. Uh, this is what you saw from Pat McCormick earlier today, and now I just want to come back to it. Uh, and if you, I want to first talk about the PI, the mission manager, and the project scientist, how critical that absolutely is. And, and I will tell you that uh, we have Joe Dizio here in the audience uh, working with the Explorer's office. Joe was the acting head of that office at that time. Uh, Herb Middleman is also here, was there. We worked so closely together that we became a team. And, and again, I think it's so important. These are not adversaries. These are indeed people who want to get this job done just as much as I wanted to get the job done. And we worked together uh, very closely on that. In the same way with the project scientists. Hans Meyer was a project scientist at the time, and all he could do was just help. I might also mention that the mission manager at the time, while we were selling this mission, uh, he would come to our meetings, and while we were dealing with problems, when the meeting was over, he had an action plan already written. Why don't you consider this? He said, look, look at this. And he was just a tremendous help. And so it just, uh, it just worked in a remarkable way. The other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the relationship with these people, the program executive, the program scientist, and the PI. I never went around the Goddard Project office, uh, but I was talking to the uh, program executive all the time. Like in any, any family, we had issues. I never talked about issues in the family with any... If I had issues here, then we talked about it. and and so. But what I, what I was able to do in talking with the program executive was deal with many issues without actually talk about it more tomorrow. Uh, things like what kind of launch vehicle, what kind of spacecraft, and all those kinds of things. The program scientist was Mary Belad. Mary uh, was so supportive and helpful all throughout uh, the development of the mission. Uh, and when we got ready to descope uh, or things of that nature. So again, the relationships are very critical. And then the, the last thing I want to talk about is the Executive Advisory Council and how that worked for us. Now the Executive Advisory Council is in place for one reason. It's not somebody you report to, at least in my view, and that's not the way we use it. It's an organization, it's a group of people. And in that case, the Executive Advisory Council consisted of the head of the Space Dynamics Laboratory, Mike Pavich, uh, the head of the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics of Colorado, who was Dan Baker, and also the vice president responsible for orbital sciences, who was Jack Danko at the time. That was the executive advisor council, myself. And the PM was there to support me. So when we had problems, uh, problems that would involve organizations or interactions between organizations or even money problems, I would go to the advisor council. We would all talk about it. I'd give them a status of where we were. I would tell them what problems we were dealing with. I'll tell you that in one case, where we, we had a, and we all wanted to win, and that was the whole point. We wanted to win this mission. We wanted it to go. We wanted it to be confirmed. So at one point, I had a $400,000 problem. Uh, I went to the only profit making part of our team, which is orbital sciences, and I talked about our problem. I said, Can you help? He said, We're, running, we're underrunning right now. It's in itself, I think, is almost unprecedented for profit-making companies to tell, tell us that. But it shows you that, that the minute, what it shows you, this team is working together. He said, we're underwriting, we'll take a $400,000 challenge. And that's what he did. And that kept us, you know, on, on track. Now, I'll say we were 
I'm saying we in this case, uh, not I, but we were one of the good guys on Paul's list, and it was because of those kinds of things that allowed that to happen. Okay, so just to summarize what I've said, and uh, this was mentioned earlier today, Benjamin Franklin at the Constitutional Convention said, we'll either all hang together, we'll all hang separately. And we all hung together on him. And that's what allowed us to get through all these things. And tomorrow, I'll be talking about staying in the box and what we did. And it's all because of us hanging together on these things. The other thing is, uh, we play strong emphasis on preparation and anticipation of issues and problems. I mean, they're going to happen. It's part of life, part of development in in this, this world. It's highly technical and advanced. It's going to happen. And so we, we tried to anticipate it in every way we could. We never did small groups. We engaged the entire team in problem solving. And the Executive Advisory Council, more than one time, it was not just money, but it was also schedules. And one's lag and the other isn't. And that council came to the forefront. And they made sure their organization picked up the slack where they needed to. Uh, and then finally, of course, there were decisions that had to be made. And if you don't make them at the right time, Sometimes I look back on, on this mission and the decisions were made. I'm not sure how that happened, but it, but it worked, and they were made at the right time. So those are some thoughts uh, for now for what, I, what we did. So thank you very much.